Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Egan. I am the Director of COVID Workplace Safety for the State of Michigan, as well as the Deputy Director for Labor in Michigan's Department of Labor. And we're continuing our College Town Outreach Series to really focus in on some unique challenges that are raised in different areas of our state. Today, of course, we're focusing in on Detroit, which includes Wayne State and the University of Detroit, as well as others uh, in the area. As we know, Detroit is the population hub of our state, so these are uh, some additional challenges that Detroit has been facing throughout the COVID crisis. What we really want to talk about and focus on today, and if you've been with me before, you're going to hear uh, much of the same information with some new caveats that we put onto it. And we also have some support and help from our friend Kevin Selmeyer, the Chief Fire Marshal for the state of Michigan, who talks about some of those capacity limit issues and questions, as well as Barb Sebastian from the Liquor Control Commission to help uh, with some of those issues and things they're doing as well as be available for questions and answers after we're done. If you are viewing today, uh, keep in mind that you can submit questions through the questions tab at the bottom of the screen and we'll try to answer as many as we can when we get to the end of the program. So what do we want to talk about with college towns is it's a really a scaling discussion. As I mentioned, Detroit's already a huge population center, but colleges re-engaging brings a new component to it that's that we have to deal with as well and that's students coming from all parts of the state from per, per, perhaps all parts of the country back to our college campuses they may not be as familiar with what we're doing in our communities and then it's up to all of us to really make sure that we reinforce uh, the masking and other requirements that we're doing to ensure that we contain COVID in our communities our goal in the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity and across the state of Michigan is to get open and stay open. And the way that we do that is to work together to make sure that we're keeping our numbers down, declining, and that we're containing COVID. And it's on all of us to take some ownership and do our part, both as individuals, as business owners, as employees, or as college students. So uh, we really have to force ourselves to make sure we don't come become complacent because Re-engaging college and re-engaging schools are huge milestones that we have to face here in the state of Michigan, and we have to be connected in our efforts and pushing the message, pushing the philosophy, and making sure that we contain COVID because what happens in one business is going to affect all of the others, and what happens off campus is going to affect life on campus. So we are connected in this fight against COVID, and we have to remember that every single day. I also need your help and we need your help pushing this message out to other businesses. Now, if you're with us today, you've self-selected to be a part of this discussion. There are a lot of businesses that aren't engaging today that also need this information and you're going to rely on them to do what's right to make sure that your business can remain open as we move forward in this fight against COVID. I can tell you that we've had discussions all over the state with colleges, including in the Detroit area, and the colleges are working very hard and they have good plans, they have good programs, they have good procedures to try to deal with the student population on campus, as well as COVID outbreaks, quarantining, isolating, uh, reinforcing good behaviors and doing those other things necessary to make sure that we contain COVID at, when those students return to campus. What we really wanna focus on with you is to make sure that we're engaged with the college and the off-campus behavior that we're communicating with landlords, local public health in our restaurant and businesses that are open to the public. We're doing the things that we can do to make sure that we're supporting that goal of getting open and staying open. And we have to think beyond what we have to do, which are some of the things we're gonna talk about today and think toward what we can do. What else can we do to help contain COVID? What haven't we thought about? And don't forget about local action. So in some communities, the local public health is uh, proposing or enforcing lower limits on outdoor gathering sizes. The state executive order allows up to 100 as long as you can social distance and you're wearing face coverings. Local public health does have the authority to shrink that. We've heard of one community that's putting out an ordinance to hold landlords accountable for what's happening in their spaces. Uh, one community has a, a known congregation point. It's a, a vacant lot that they've hired security for to make sure they can disperse crowds in that area. And, you know, think about that off-campus spot that everybody seems to know the students go to. Maybe that's something you want to consider in your communities. And we're going to talk a lot today about things you need to do in your workplace to make sure that you're ready. And that includes having a written preparedness and response plan. It's required by the executive order. Uh, 
uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Make sure you're doing those daily health screenings of your employees. Make sure you're following and requiring the masking for all of your staff and the customers coming in, except those that meet an exception. Make sure you're following those limitations on size. Make sure you're doing the postings, the signs and notices. Uh, think about closing areas. For restaurants, we'll talk about a little bit more specifically, but your waiting area should be closed. You should be finding ways to make sure you're controlling crowds outside that might be waiting to get in. Maybe that's offering tickets or doing more reservations or some other mechanism, but these are all things that we have to do in the state of Michigan together to make sure that we can reach our goal of getting open and staying open because People have to work, businesses need to operate, and we need to do these things to make sure that we're moving ourselves forward in the fight against COVID while we're containing it and uh, revitalize our, our economy and keeping working people working. So one of the things that we're focusing in on, if we look at the COVID cases across the state of Michigan, we're a touch over 93,000 confirmed cases, and that includes about 15,000 in Wayne County and about 13,000 in the city of Detroit. And we're seeing a lot of that uh, virus move from what was originally sort of the uh, older age groups to the spread is increasing more rapidly in those younger age groups, as you can see in the graph on the right hand side with Wayne County on how many of those cases are falling in that zero to 29 age group. And we're seeing that across the state of Michigan, where the 20 to 29 year old right in that college age wheelhouse is starting to see their case numbers increase at a faster rate than others. So this is for a lot of reasons. Some of it's uh, things that we can control. Some of it's reinforcing that behavior that we've talked about that we have to understand that it's not necessarily that the restaurant per se is a problem area. It's that we're congregating there. So we're gonna talk about some of those things, but taking ownership in our own lives to recognize that congregating is bad when we're trying to contain COVID. So one of the things that you know that you have to comply with uh, that we're all working through is masking requirement. The governor created a strong masking requirement that all individuals, if they are indoors in any public space, have to wear face covering. You have to wear it if you're outdoors and cannot maintain six feet of social distance and businesses have to require customers to wear those masks. And the reason for that, and what I always talk about is there's a 24 seven news cycle around COVID and we know that there's a lot of noise, but there's there are things that have remained static throughout this whole crisis. And that's the need to social distance, the uh, face mask cutting transmission and practicing good hygiene, make sure we're washing and stuff. This virus primarily spreads through large respiratory droplets, meaning that when we talk, cough, sing, sneeze, uh, we're expelling aerosols are large droplets from our respiratory system that can travel and infect another person. So if we're maintaining that social distance, that helps minimize the likelihood of somebody else picking that up. If we're wearing the face covering, that further minimizes the chances of us spreading that virus. And about 40% or so of those that are gonna have COVID will never have a symptom. And we know a significant percentage of folks spreading this virus are also pre-symptomatic, meaning they feel fine at the time. So that just reinforces this concept that we have to maintain that six feet of social distance the best that we can. We need to wear the face coverings to help slow or prevent the transmission. And we need to practice good hygiene because you can still pick it up from surfaces that, that may have some of those things on them. And we can see from this chart that when we did stay home, stay safe, our numbers were spiking and that's like the ultimate social distance. We have practically no chance of transmission because we are not engaging, we're not congregating. Then our lowest potential transmission is when we are social distancing and wearing face coverings and we're still low if we're both wearing masks. Now, some of the science tells us that if we're both wearing these face coverings, it can reduce transmission by about 70%, which is why it's so critical. And it really cuts down on the distance that any kind of droplets we create can travel from us. So to reopen and operate safely, there are some things that you just have to do, and that's follow the executive orders, make a good faith effort to adhere to the guidelines, and then again, think beyond and what you could do next. Make sure you're training your employees on health and safety practices, including how COVID spreads, 
uh, and what they need to be doing in the workplace, include, including washing. We're going to get into the COVID workplace safety website a little bit more further, but you can definitely always find good information at the Michigan Safe Start site. And there are about eight steps that we really focus in on that you need to do to make sure that you're keeping your workers and your customers safe. Now, we don't have listed on here what we refer to as engineering controls, but you need to be thinking about those and doing those where it makes sense. Engineering controls, when we use that terminology, mean things that are more permanent. That would be the plastic barriers, changes to your ventilation system, some of those pieces. Administrative controls are those things that you can do just by managing, and that includes making sure you have good access controls. When we talk about health screening, we're trying to eliminate that potential hazard of COVID from the workplace. That's why the health screening is so crucial. That is the ultimate goal of all safety programs is to eliminate the hazard and then move through other pieces when you can't do that. So the health screening helps eliminate the hazard from the workplace by making sure employees that have those symptoms are out, outside of the workplace, but also think about how you're the, uh, allowing customers to come in where you know are you requiring the face coverings are you making sure you're posting the signs that say do not come in if you're sick if you are not open to the public are you setting appointments and doing the things necessary to make sure that those customers coming in aren't carrying the virus into your workplace those distancing pieces the the six feet of social distancing the the capacity limits within the restaurants making sure that we have that six feet of separation to the maximum extent practical to cut down on the transmission of the virus and then sanitation tools like making sure you're doing regular cleaning uh, after customers leave or well, um, daily went to make sure that the site is clear and clean and then deeper cleaning protocols if you have a positive or a suspected COVID case in your workplace and how you're going to handle that Hygiene practices within your workplace, making sure your employees have time to wash up, make sure they're making sure they're doing it regularly. But that needs to be part of your preparedness and response plan in case you have those positive cases or one of your employees comes in uh, with symptoms and otherwise on how you're going to manage those types of things. So one of a great tool that you can find on our website that I'll mention in just a minute is this great video that will uh, kind of explain some of these requirements for the bar and restaurant space. For food service employees and their employers, there are new ways to work safely to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Designate one or more worksite supervisors to implement, monitor, and report on the COVID-19 preparedness and response plan. Develop daily entry screening protocol for employees and contractors. Display a door or sidewalk sign with the services available, instructions for pickup, and hours of operation. Reserve parking spaces near the front door for curbside pickup only. Limit capacity to 50% of normal seating. Require six feet of separation between parties or groups at different tables or bar tops. Close waiting areas and ask customers to wait in cars for a call when their table is ready. Create or post communication materials for customers, including instructing customers to wear a face covering or mask until they are seated. Close self-serve food or drink options, such as buffets, salad bars, and drink stations. Require hosts and servers to wear face coverings. Food preparers should wear face coverings and gloves in the kitchen area when handling food. Install physical barriers such as sneeze guards and partitions at cash registers, bars, host stands, and other areas where maintaining physical distance of six feet is difficult. Limit number of employees in shared spaces. Provide physical guides such as tape on floors or sidewalks and signage on walls to ensure that customers remain at least six feet apart in any lines. And wherever you work, here are some guidelines and safety precautions for you to do your part in reducing the spread of COVID-19. Limit close contact with others by maintaining a distance of at least six feet when possible. Minimize handling of cash, credit cards, and mobile devices, and wash or sanitize your hands after handling. Practice routine cleaning and disinfection of frequently touched surfaces and tools. Wash your hands regularly with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your eyes, 
nose, or mouth. And be sure to follow these safety precautions. Wear face coverings or masks. Check for symptoms that often include fever or abnormal cough or shortness of breath. Stay home if you are sick or have been in close contact with someone who is sick. Report your diagnostic test results and exposures to your employer and participate honestly and urgently in workplace safety training. For additional resources, visit michigan.gov slash myosha. This is uh, one of the, that's an example of one of the many tools that we have available through michigan.gov COVID workplace safety. And certainly feel free to use it, post it, however you'd like, but it certainly synthesizes a lot of the requirements that are in that restaurant and bar space specifically. Uh, there are additional regulations that you need to follow, and that includes uh, some that may be more restrictive or specific based on where you are or, the, or your region or industry. And uh, as an example, some indoor services restricted at bars that are earning more than 70% of their gross receipts from alcohol sales, but I will leave that to Barb to touch on uh, beyond me. I see that Kevin couldn't make it with us today. He got tied up in a meeting that obviously has run over, but our state fire marshal, Kevin Selmeyer, is available to help on some of those capacity issues. And just so everyone is aware and understands that the Bureau of Fire Services uh, does have regulatory authority over the following venues, which include college and university classrooms and dormitories, as well as places of public assemblage. And those certainly include restaurants, bars, movie theaters, concert venues, clubs, or other any lo uh, locations where people will congregate. And they are the folks when you normally see either them directly or working with local fire departments and public health that you see those signs like how many people can be in this location. They are working with businesses across the state of Michigan as they sort of sort out like a restaurant because layouts aren't perfectly rectangular like they were in that video. How many tables you may be able to have in there with uh, and make sure that you maintain that social distancing. So you definitely want to check in with them as well as your local fire department can help with that in those types of venues. Uh, to calculate your capacity. If you are over capacity, they certainly have the tools to, uh, you know, enforce the capacity limits and prohibit anyone else from entering or they may even temporarily close the venue if it becomes necessary. And they always work with local government and state partners to determine whether any licensing action is warranted. And uh, Kevin puts his cell phone number right on this slide. So make sure that you jot that down if you'd like to reach out to him with questions about some of those capacity issues and other things that we're working on. And now I'll turn it over to our friend Barb Sebastian, who's from the with the Liquor Control Commission to kind of talk through some of the pieces they're working on. Good afternoon and thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, program. Just want to let everybody know that uh, the Liquor Control Commission is out there. As a lot of the businesses know, we enforce the liquor laws and rules. We also have been enforcing some of the, uh, the uh, governor's executive orders. We want to make sure that everybody's in compliance, that customers, employees, licensees are all safe. The same with the public. Uh, we do take action if we find that licensees are disregarding the laws or rules or the executive orders. Our first goal, however, is education. We're trying to work with businesses. We know these are tough times and not everybody knows what's expected of them. <clears throat> we also work with local departments as well, police departments, uh, on uh, making sure that businesses are in compliance. We also give them funding so they can enforce our laws and rules and the executive orders. We also educate licensees, uh, typically in groups, about liquor laws so that they do know what's expected of them. Uh, if you would like to check out resources on our website, the web address is there, michigan.gov slash LCC. We have all kinds of good information for you, information about COVID stuff, reopening resources, application forms for new permits that have been created during COVID to assist businesses in uh, increasing their capacity outdoors, things like that. Uh, if you have any questions for me directly, you can contact me at my email address. I'd be happy to help you out. And I did want to add to that, literally the Liquor Commission is very committed to working with businesses to make sure they can get open and stay open safely. That's very important. The bad news is, as all of you know, uh, the bar scene typically is a uh, spreader of COVID-19. Human behavior in bars tends to facilitate that. 
when people stand close together, talk loudly, try to talk over music, crowd each other when they're drinking, that uh, lessens inhibitions and uh, decreases good judgment many times. We know that the people in the age groups who are going to bars are younger people. And like Sean had said, they used to be a low percent of people that are getting infected, but that's changing as they're congregating more. And that's alarming. We don't want that to happen. We'd like that to reverse. Please keep in mind that uh, in your businesses, you're required to have your employees and your customers wearing masks unless they're, they have an exemption to do that. You are allowed to ask customers to remove their masks for identification purposes so you can make sure that they're of legal age, make sure that they're not intoxicated. We do expect you to do that. Those are some things we will be doing out in the field as well. Um, did want to let you know too that uh, dancing is prohibited by customers and topless activity is also restricted right now. Those are things that can't happen during the uh, executive orders. So make sure that you don't allow those sorts of activities in your business which could spread COVID. Uh, but we are here to, as a resource. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions or if you need any information. Uh, Sean did mention the 70% thing. We are getting a lot of calls about that. And just to let businesses know, they're restricted from having indoor dining if 70% or more of their gross receipts come from the sale of alcohol. We're going by the common de definition of gross receipts. This would be a figure that's typically reported on a tax return and it would include whatever legal income you are declaring from your business. If you have any questions about that, you might want to confer with your CPA or bookkeeper so that you know what where you stand in that requirement. requirement. Excuse me. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Uh, as it relates to workplace safety, we have a lot of resources available. The MyOSHA team and our communications team have done a great job since the beginning of this crisis to make sure that businesses and employees have the tools that they need to understand what should be happening in the workplace uh, for both the employer and the employee. And these include industry specific guidelines created by MyOSHA, which cover the executive orders as well as the CDC uh, guidelines for places of employment for every industry that's been named in an, exec in an, in an executive order. Don't say that fast. Uh, we have reopening checklists, fact sheets, videos similar to the one that you saw and more. We have some social media tools that you can use as well as posters. Some of the examples of posters shown here and there are more include the masking requirement posters and then for certain types of industries like we won't, the one we see here for a restaurant, just noting that the waiting area is closed and that you should wait in your car and some other capacity limit signs. So make sure you check those out and use those uh, in your place of business. You can find more information from the City of Detroit Public Health Department as well as Wayne County Health Department. They have great resources available to deal with COVID-19 in your communities. Certainly our Michigan.gov COVID workplace safety site, we have all of those guidelines and other tools there. We have links over to the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. They have a Peer Michigan Business Connect program that you can use to find PPE you may need for your workplace, which would include hand sanitizer, physical barriers and other things. Uh, for the daily health screening, there is a wonderful My Symptoms app that's available. It's free. It was created by DHHS and the University of Michigan to help you with that daily questionnaire component. Certain industries, ma uh, manufacturing, meat packaging, and casinos have to also include a temperature screen. Other, other uh, types of businesses are encouraged but not required. This Symptoms app will get you through the questionnaire portion. As an employer, you just go to the app itself and set up an employer account. You'll designate who you want reports to go to and other things. And then you'll get a specific number for your business that you give to your employees. Then they can use their smartphone, tablet, desktop, whatever tool they have to fill out the questionnaire before they come to work and they'll get a green, they're good to go, or they'll get an orange, something is flagged and they should contact their manager as well as their uh, medical care provider. Certainly, we have links over to the Safe Start map and Safe Start information, which you should be checking out pretty regularly. And then uh, information over to the Mask Up campaign that DHHS is uh, working through to make sure that we're encouraging that behavior. And if you think about how I laid out how the virus spreads and all of these executive orders are kind of are they're designed to get that six feet of social distance and mask wearing to make sure that we're really cutting the transmission of COVID. 
In the Myosha team, it created early on in the crisis a wonderful hotline that employers and employees can call with questions related to COVID. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's 855 safe c 19 You'll talk directly with a Myosha person. The average wait time has been about 15 seconds. That's right, 15 seconds. And the average call is about four to five minutes, depending on what issues you have. If you're an employer and you're still sort of confused or you need more help, we have a wonderful consultation team at Myosha that they will get you over to that can help talk you through or even in some cases come on site and help you through some of the things that you should or could be doing in your workplace. And then likewise for employees calling in, if it's necessary, they can get them over to the complaint side of the Myosha process to move things forward. So don't underestimate the value of these tools and make sure you're taking advantage of them. That Myosha team is ready, willing, and able to talk with anybody in the state about uh, their workplace as it relates to COVID and trying to make sure that we all have the tools to succeed and contain COVID in our communities. So with that, we will end the presentation portion and move into the question and answers. Perfect, thanks for that, Sean. Uh, my name is Erica and I'm going to be reading off the questions that you guys have submitted while Sean was presenting. And if you have additional questions, go ahead and hop over to the Q&A tab within this event and enter your questions and we'll get to them. All uh, right, with that, the first question for you, Sean, is if college cafeterias have to follow the same guidance as restaurants, then how should they limit the capacity to 50% when they're required to feed a certain amount of students? So there's a lot of ways and a lot of creative ways that we're seeing and, and, and you can do this uh, across the state of Michigan and that's, you know, setting times, you can use names, you can use student IDs, whatever it is that you need to do to have a certain amount of people coming through at a certain time. We know that most cafeterias have gone to a, a box. You pick up a box and leave. Uh, the buffet should be closed. You know, I know a lot of campuses have the buffet that should be closed for sure. And, uh, you know, just find ways to stagger the amount of people coming through at any given time. And certainly if you can keep tabs on how many people are in there. And then if students are trying to dine indoors, maybe, uh, you know, obviously you need the six feet of social distance and you need to limit the capacity of seating. So students are going to have to find places to eat. And we understand that. But uh, certainly uh, there are you know, some creative ways that you can uh, minimize the number of people coming in at any given time. All right. Our next question asks, if a worker tests positive for COVID-19 and then overcomes the illness, what are the correct return to work rules? So the CDC has recently updated their guidance on uh, return to work, quarantines, and et cetera, and is moving away unless you're in certain industries the healthcare industry and others, they have some testing regimens that, that may be used, but for most of us, it's just going to be a, a time period. So it's 10 days and uh, no fever for 24 hours and your symptoms are lessening without medication. All right, and if my job can be performed remotely, can my employer require me to come back to the office? He doesn't take this pandemic seriously, so how can I talk to him about uh, doing so? So under Executive Order 160, which opens uh, some businesses and, and kind of changes some of the parameters, uh, the governor moved for any region outside of six and eight, which includes the Detroit area, as well as most of the lower peninsula, except for Traverse City, uh, to a requirement that uh, remote work must be performed where it can be. So they should certainly engage with their employer to talk about what their job duties are. An employer will need to make a determination and they can do it on, you know, if they need to come in one day a week and pick up work or do something like that. Uh, but the employer will need to make that determination to really promote remote work to the extent, the maximum extent possible for workers. And if the worker remains concerned, they may file a complaint with Myosha. All right. And what can we do to make sure employees are following rules outside of work? So one of the things that we're trying to do with the health screening, and it includes have you been around or uh, within close contact of anyone else that has COVID or has COVID symptoms to try to make sure that we can navigate that way. Now, obviously an employer 
uh, when the employee is off the clock, really doesn't have any role in what that employee is doing in their life, but they can definitely reinforce those concepts within the workplace and talk with their employees about, you know, their role in containing COVID. And, you know, like I mentioned, all of us taking some ownership about our own behaviors because the backyard barbecue where we're congregating can be a cause for spread it just as easily as anywhere else. So we really need to pay attention to what it is we're doing and making sure that we're being responsible to contain COVID because the goal here is to get open and stay open. And all of us have a stake in that. So we really have to, to just keep reinforcing that concept. All right, and it looks like our last question here says, are inspections being done to check if businesses are following the rules? Absolutely, absolutely, uh, on many levels. So we're coordinating closely with the local public health departments as well as local law enforcement where we can across agencies within the state. Certainly the Myosha folks have been out investigating when complaints come in. We have uh, an emphasis program where, where we're doing spot checks, where they're going into restaurants, bars, and retail to uh, you know, do a, a snap inspection just to see if uh, businesses are complying. They'll do some coaching and some training and to make sure that the uh, executive orders and CDC guidelines that we posted on that COVID workplace safety site are being followed. If I could add also at the Liquor Commission, uh, we have been getting complaints about the uh, governor's executive orders. Unfortunately, every time a new one comes out within about five minutes, we're getting phone calls that somebody isn't meeting them. Uh, we're trying to get good information on the front side. We're contacting businesses and checking to see what's true and what's not. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, our main goal is to educate licensees first and foremost, make sure that they know what's expected of them, make sure that they're in compliance for the protection of all. Uh, in some severe cases, we may have to take action. Um, I'm hoping that that will not be the case as we move forward, that businesses take this seriously and comply with the order without us having to go there. Thank you. All right, well, that so all the questions that we received uh, for this event. So if there's anything further you want to add, Sean, we'll close it out. Sure, I appreciate everyone taking the time today to get this information. As I mentioned, these are huge milestones for us and we're really gonna have to focus and work together to make sure that we are containing COVID and keeping getting open and staying open. And that includes, as I mentioned, pushing this information beyond just us and making sure that other businesses in your area are doing everything that they can to help you stay open. Because uh, when we talk about COVID spreading in our communities, you know, by the time someone that's not doing it right has an issue, it's a big issue for the whole community. And that really impacts us all. And it, it puts the governor and DHHS in very difficult position on how we protect Michiganders. So we have to do our part all the time, every day. And we really have to enforce those, reinforce those behaviors in each other that, you know, congregating is a challenge. We we need to maintain that social distance. We need to wear the face coverings and it doesn't matter, matter your age group. So if certain groups of people are thinking that they won't get that sick or it's not that big of a deal for them, it's still a big deal for our communities and it's putting people at risk and it's putting our economy at risk. So we have to take uh, ownership and lead by example in this crisis and make sure that we're doing everything we can to, to push Michigan forward and contain COVID as we really overcome these challenges with re-engaging college and re-engaging K through 12, where we know they're kind of designed congregation points. So do everything you can, think about what you can do, uh, think about moving beyond the requirements and, and implementing everything you can think of and share those ideas because uh, we're all learning together, but we need to make sure that we're taking this serious and not getting complacent. So I appreciate the time and you know, if, if you miss this one or you want to check in again, we're doing this around the state, so feel free and I appreciate it.